So welcome everyone. On behalf of ARMA and the Technical Committee on Hindu Seismicity, chaired by Ahmad Ghassami, myself, Sean Maxwell, and uh, also helping out Jens Lund Stern and Mahdi Haddad, we welcome you to our monthly webinars. Um, <clears throat> so today's webinar, we're very excited to have uh, Eve Guglielmi from Lawrence Berkeley uh, presenting. So this is some uh, really interesting research and actually a number of the presenters from previous webinars have referred to uh, Eve's work in this area. So we're, we're very excited to uh, see what Eve has to, to share this morning. Just before we pass it over to Eve though, just uh, a few kind of housekeeping things. So first of all, last webinar was in May given by Rebecca Savage and Dave Eaton. Uh, an interesting webinar where they went through uh, a case study of the Peace River earthquake se sequence and ran a poll with the, uh, the participants to try to uh, use some uh, published material to try to characterize is the sequence uh, believed to be induced or, uh, or natural. Um, so Rebecca shared a slide just kind of summarizing the, the outcome of that survey. It looks like we had uh, about 22 participants going through responding to a series of questions and focusing in on kind of the, the pie chart on the, the left-hand side, the, the summary, it looks like from that uh, subset, about a little under half of the uh, participants answered the questions implying that the, uh, the sequence was induced. Um, over a third though were uh, indicating that, uh, you know, equivoc equivocal ambiguous kind of results, a smaller percentage indicating that it's likely natural. So kind of an interesting outcome. And if anybody has any, uh, any questions, I'm sure Rebecca or Dave Eaton would be happy to uh, follow up on that. And if you missed the webinar, it's recorded and on the YouTube channel. Um, so again, just wanted to kind of wrap up that since there is an interactive poll as part of that webinar. So with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Jens to talk about the upcoming series. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we're building the schedule for speakers in the fall, and we have some good ones coming up. Uh, two to mention, one for August uh, and one for September. Uh, again, this is these will be the first Friday of those months, except for September, where it's actually the second Friday. Note that that's September the 8th. So we have Mark Novakovich from uh, Nanometrics speaking uh, in August, and then, uh, and then Brandon Schmann from the University of New Mexico. Uh, he'll probably be speaking about the Rotone Basin, uh, but that's uh, to be determined, um, speaking on, again, the second Friday of September. Thanks, Sean. Good morning, everyone. This is Mahdi Hatta from the Bureau of Economic Geology. I would like to highlight some of the logistical point, uh, points about these uh, webinars. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, almost 600 people in the distribution list, but we would like to uh, uh, extend this message of the webinar to uh, more interested uh, people uh, in a larger community. So please feel free to share the webinar invites with your colleagues who are interested in this topic. And uh, uh, you can forward uh, their email address and affiliation to the uh, committee to add them to the distribution list. And everyone will be muted during the talk, but after the formal part, you can unmute yourself to ask you the question yourself. But please uh, keep in mind that you can submit your questions in the chat function of the Zoom meeting. Uh, and uh, we would go through uh, this uh, list of questions uh, after uh, the presentation. This uh, specific meeting will be recorded and this recording will be posted in our YouTube channel. Please refer to the invitation email for the link of this YouTube channel and uh, please subscribe to this channel for the notification. Without further delay, let's uh, have Eve uh, Guglielmi to start the presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us and thank for presenting. Okay, so um, thank you everyone and thanks again for that uh, very nice invitation. Let me share my screen. Oop. Okay. Okay, seeing the shared screen, uh, but not yet. There it goes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Eve. 
Okay, so um, title, as uh, mentioned before, um, I will try to show you some, let's say, relatively recent um, direct observations of uh, fault uh, seismicity and leakage. First, starting with kind of implication for uh, some um, of the big concerns of about uh, subsurface storage and energy development. Um, okay, I am the guy talking today, but it's the work of many colleagues. I will mention them at the very last slide in my talk. So um, I feel very sorry. There are so many colleagues I could not put all of them in that first slide. So if we start with a very simple slide um, and we take the example of we are at LBNL uh, working quite a lot on uh, the, the context of uh, CO2 sequestration at, at depth. And we are moving to the idea of um, if there are many um, CO2 um, injection projects in the same basin, uh, it will obviously induce a widespread uh, pressurization of that basin, as you may see on the, on the left of this slide. This actually is a relatively old simulation made by Holzer and others, um, where they calculated the, the pressure increase um, in the injection reservoir um, if, um, as you may see, if you see my mouse, about uh, 20 um, injection wells were set in uh, the Illinois Basin. And uh, you see the result uh, with my mouse. You see it can uh, trigger some significant increase in the pore pressure in the reservoir. And now if you move uh, to the right, taking another example, we all know now that um, such an increase in pressure may lead to an increase in induced seismicity, maybe not where the injection takes place, but maybe deeper, as observed in the Oklahoma on the faults affecting the basement. Um, so very short introduction about that. Just to mention that in that talk, I made the drastic choice, I would say, to show you um, one of the concerns uh, we are working on at LBL, which is, um, about uh, faults affecting um, the reservoir caprox system, and especially faults affecting caprox. Um, you see on the right a very uh, schematic view. If you inject, for example, CO2 in a deep reservoir, again, it will increase the pressure. Eventually, it will reach a fault, and that fault may start to move under pressure, leak, and eventually create seismicity. So this is what I want to explore with you to show you some observations that can help better understanding the physics of these faults affecting very uh, rich in clay minerals um, formations uh, such as caprox. So in more details, the key questions are um, what kind of relationship is there between a pressure increase, a fault movement, opening and sleep, eventually free migration. Um, what is the mechanism? Can it create seismicity, even in a caprock? <clears throat> and after the activation, what happens? Is there any sealing or healing of the activated fault? And finally, but not least, I would say, we are talking about uh, injecting complex fluids, not only water, but uh, for example, CO2 dissolved in water, with, as we know, very versatile uh, changes in the phase of the CO2. Is that possible that a change phase of CO2, for example, can modify uh, the fault stability also? So we try to go through these kind of questions, not trying to discuss that, but show you some results we have so far. And uh, these results, if I can move to the next slide, which is blocked, okay. Okay, there it is. So these results, I will focus only on one uh, set of experiments we have been and we are still doing in Switzerland, as you see on the left. It's in an underground research laboratory called the Monterey Laboratory. It's just at the border between Switzerland and France. You see the, the red point here and you see here on the lower left corner, you have the underground galleries in red. And um, 
This site is interesting because the galleries, as you see, are intersected by one fault, which is the gray plane. And so we use the galleries to easily access through uh, short balls uh, the fault. And this is from these balls that we make experiments of fault activation. So how do we do that? This is what is shown on the right. I would say basically we lower in the ball and across the fault. So what you see here, you have a, a, a photo of the fault with, um, I, will, I will give you more uh, deeper um, um, information about the fault later, but you see basically that uh, you have a black zone and a grayish one. And uh, you see the, the main fault share zone here, if you see my mouse, which is uh, underlined by some gouge. And on one side, the left side, we could call it the foot wall, uh, there is some scaly clay material, uh, which is um, completely destroyed uh, clay. And on the right uh, side, the hanging wall, it's less deformed. It's more a, a fractured zone. Um, of the of the opalinus clay, which is the layer in which the Monterey is set. Just to mention before we start, uh, so uh, the permeability of this formation is very small. Uh, it's close to 10 to minus 18 to 10 to minus 20 meters square. And the fault permeability, the initial fault permeability, is about the same as the permeability of the intact rock. So we are in the case of uh, we identify a clear fault zone, but the permeability of this fault is about the same as the permeability of the rock, the intact rock, which I think is kind of what we should expect in a cap rock. So how do we activate? We lower in a ball drilled across the fault zone, this kind of um, system that is uh, schematically figured here. It's a double straddle packer system. The, the packers are the gray cylinders figured here. Uh, so they inflate in the ball and they allow to seal a section across the fault. And in that section, we are going to inject water or more complex water with, for example, dissolved CO2. We'll show you an example. At high pressure, in order to lower the normal stress uh, on the fault and eventually make it move. While we do that, we will monitor the fault movement. Here, I just show an example of one probe we, 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 uh, we have been developing for years. It's a probe that is anchoring on both sides of the principal share zone here, and that allows to monitor the displacements of the fault in three dimensions, so we can get the slip and the opening. The depth of these experiments is quite shallow. You see it here, it's about 300 meters. And you have that uh, stereogram here, which is showing um, the stress tensor and the uh, principal stress magnitudes, which range uh, for the minimum one between 4.4 and the maximum is about eight. Actually, um, these experiments, because they are um, in a very accessible uh, zone, um, we can set a, a bunch of um, very complementary instruments. This is what I am showing here. Uh, for example, in all the boreholes, we have um, distributed um, strains and temperatures measured with optical fibers. You see it um, in the lower um, in the lower figure here. So the fibers are cemented behind casing, while inside casing, for example, we have our injection device. With this in all the overalls, to, just to give you an idea, on such an experiment, we have about two to three kilometers of fibers, given uh, uh, that we have about uh, 40 balls. Some are, as you see in the upper right, intersecting the fault. You see the, the inclined one. Others are not intersecting the fault. They are parallel or sub-parallel to the fault uh, deep. And um, in these overalls, um, here you have some figures uh, with uh, blue stars and other uh, figures with uh, red triangles. In these boreholes, we have some uh, seismic, um, passive, and active monitoring. Um, 
about the, the active monitoring, um, I, will, I will show some interesting new results about that. The idea is to uh, have a, a seismic sources, which are the blue stars in the hanging wall of the fault that send seismic waves across the fault to receivers, which are set in uh, to the red balls and which correspond to the red triangles. This is done continuously while we are injecting and thus activating the fault. And what we are tracking here is the change in the seismic waves velocities that could be induced by the pressurization and the movements of the fault. So um, after that introduction, I, I tried to organize my talk in three main uh, directions, I would say. First, I will throw the direct observations of fault leakage and seismicity that come from such an experiment. Second, I will try to show you the links and the relationships we are trying to make between these, let's say, geophysical observations and the fault geology. And third, I will show you how these experiments allowed also to test and validate some new monitoring techniques. For example, that uh, active seismic monitoring technique that I described uh, in the slide before. So I start with the first point, direct observations of leakage and seismicity during the activation of the Monterey fault. What you're seeing here is one experiment that we conducted in um, 2020. You may look first at the upper graph. Um, the horizontal axis is the time, and um, the blue curve is the pressure applied at the injection point, and the red curve is the flow rate. Um, in this experiment, we control the flow rate and we measure the, the pressure. So it's a flow controlled constant flow rate injection experiment. And as you see, we made six constant flow rate injection cycles. Between each cycle, there was about half an hour to an hour uh, of um, non injection. And um, at the end, I, I make it schematic, we did much more than that. But at the end of each injection cycle, just before we, we stop the injection, we have what you are seeing below, which are um, P waves um, velocities tomographies um, made with that active seismic monitoring system. I recall to you where we are sending seismic sources from the uh, blue stars to the red triangles. So the, the six figures correspond to what we are seeing about the P-wave anomaly at the end of the six injection cycles. And the colors correspond to the variations in P-wave velocities in meters per second. And what you may clearly see, I guess, is that there is a progressive um, migration of a growing dark blue patch, which corresponds to a decrease in the P-wave velocities um, from the red point, which here is in the middle of the image. So the red point is the injection point. So if you go to the upper left, the injection point is that inclined borehole, and um, you see the, the, the magenta, the, the greenish, I would say, uh, plane corresponds to a schematic view of the fault plane. And what we are seeing in the image is a front view of the fault plane. OK, so back to the result here. You see that um, there is a growing low P wave anomaly, um, which is uh, growing in size. But also, you may see that it's growing in one given direction. It's not growing symmetrically around the injection point. Um, don't pay too much attention to the stripes that you are seeing on these images, which are um, mainly related to the geometry of uh, uh, the, the active seismic monitoring system. You recognize these three stripes here of uh, dark blue uh, corresponding to the location of the three uh, injection um, uh, source boreholes, you see. But basically, if you take the envelope 
of the P wave anomaly, you see that it's migrating along the strike of the fault um, towards the right. So thanks to the other measurements, what we can say as a first um, analysis of why this is migrating towards the, the northeast of the fault towards the right is that first, um, it's um, kind of um, uh, following um, what we observe in the monitoring wells. For example, here you have uh, the, the dark points, which are all monitoring wells, also the white star. And in these monitoring wells, we, for example, make a, a very basic uh, fault for pressure monitoring. And uh, it's very consistent that, uh, for example, the, the wells like this one or the white star that are included in the uh, P wave anomaly show a pore pressure increase, which means that uh, there is a hydraulic connection between the injection red point and these wells. While these wells, like uh, for example, this point here or that one, which are outside the anomaly, show no pressure increase. And, um, and it's very consistent with the anomaly then. So, which makes us think that the P wave uh, reduction is clearly um, imaging the leakage into the fault. The other observation that we have in these wells, we have these uh, three dimensional displacement fault, fault displacement sensors. And um, here I made it very simple, but if you look at the stereographic uh, plot here, you have the fault trace, which is that, for example, uh, semi semicircle trace. And you have that uh, tadpole here, which is the slip measured by the instrument at that monitoring point. And um, so this is at the monitoring point. You can look at another uh, point. We also monitor, for example, at the injection. And you see again that we have a very consistent orientation of the slip. And if you look at the slip, you see that the slip um, deep direction is kind of going towards uh, the northeast. So it has a strike slip component. And uh, we could say that maybe um, the migration of uh, uh, the, the leakage uh, flow path or the P wave velocity anomaly is kind of following the slip direction measured of the fault, which indirectly means that. Uh, the, the leakage is following the stress or the stress gradient. I will come back to that uh, on the fault. About seismicity during such an experiment. Again, you see the lower graph is the same as before with the six cycles. And above, you have the cumulative number of located events. So we are not ejecting so much water, so we don't have such a huge amount of events. We are also located in a, a clay rich uh, fault, which is not supposed to produce so much seismicity. But nevertheless, I guess you can clearly see that at each injection cycle, we create some uh, induced seismicity. So if we go in more details about that seismicity, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, in, in a recent paper, we have been looking at um, uh, another experiment actually made on the same fault, uh, but uh, it was an older experiment, I would say. Nevertheless, um, we were injecting in a borehole that you see here in the upper right. And um, we had a monitoring hole here at about three meters um, distance from the injection borehole. And um, I will not go too much into details, but um, we have a hydraulic connection between the injection ball and the monitoring hole. Um, how do you see that? Uh, you see the blue curve here is showing the pressure at the injection. When it gets to a, a high value, suddenly there is a drop in pressure, which means the fault starts to leak. So injected water starts to penetrate into the fault. And after a while, you see the time here is. Um, is in minutes. After several minutes, you see a clear increase in the pressure at the monitoring well, which is the, the black curve. We hear 
at least a very big event corresponding to a drop in pressure. And before that, also a smaller event. What is interesting here is if we look at um, what's happening about um, uh, the displacement, for example, we can start with that. And uh, if you look at um, the, the black curve, it's showing the displacement at the monitoring point. So the displacement of the fault measured at the monitoring point. And you may see here that the black curve starts to vary a little below 260 minutes. So where that uh, green arrow is shown, so it starts to vary, obviously, before we start to see the variation in the pore pressure at the same point. If you look at the lower graph, the third graph from the top, you have uh, different um, seismic signals, I would say, because we have a different type of instruments, which are details here on the left. But basically, if you pay attention to that period from before 260 to when we have uh, a, the, a big jump in the displacement, you see that there is not much to observe on all the sensors. And um, I think given the broad range of a seismic sensor uh, that we had, we can reasonably conclude that this initial period was almost aseismic, at least until I would say 290. And then at 290 to before the big jump here in displacement, you start to see big events here. And when you look in more details at these events, um, they look like what I am showing now, if you just look at the right side, uh, middle graph, you see one of these events, you see it's kind of a long duration, long period event, could be qualified as a, a tremor. Also during this period, if you go to the lower graph, and now if you look at the noise recorded on, on the different uh, seismic sensors, again, these are the same sensors, we just looked at the noise, you see an increase in the noise during this period. So there is this transition period where we transition from a seismic maybe to some uh, occurrence of uh, tremors and increase in the noise level on the, on the different sensors. And finally, but finally you see uh, way after you have that big displacement and that big pressure drop here at the monitoring point, you see the histogram here is showing when we have most of the seismicity. And if you look at the seismicity, you can go to the lower right of the image with more classical seismicity, like a micro earthquakes, burst of micro earthquakes. So there's a kind of chronology that we see here. First, a seismic sleep, then increase in the noise and tremors, arrival of the pressurized water, and then micro, a burst of micro earthquakes. Um, I jump to another observation that we make in these faults. And here it's another paper that we made. So I suggest that we first just look at the right column here in the slide. Um, it's actually the same experiment as the one uh, I showed in the, um, in the slide before. You see um, the upper graph is showing that we increased step by step the pressure in the fault until leakage occurred. You see that big drop in pressure. But um, what is interesting is while there is the drop in pressure, we suddenly switch from zero leakage, the red curve, to a leakage uh, flow rate of about uh, 30 liters per minute. And again, you see the seismicity coming after, which I described before. The interesting thing, again, is uh, that the slip on the fold occurred before the opening of the fault. You can see it here in details in the middle graph. But uh, what I am adding here is um, the lower graph, which is showing how the fault permeability, which is the y-axis on the right here, increased um, with the uh, diminution of the effective normal stress in the fault. And what you see is that it increased of several orders of magnitude. And what you also see is that uh, we had to almost lower the normal stress, the effective normal stress 
on the fold to zero to get that permeability increase. Now, I'm not going to make it um, um, too long, but if you move to the left side, I just added here an older experiment that we, we did on a carbonate fault. That's a, a, a science paper that we published. Um, and um, just to show the difference. Uh, for example, if you look at the upper graph, the difference is in the blue and the red curves. Well, we increase the pressure, so it's the same protocol. We increase the pressure step by step, but here, because the, the fault in carbonate has an initial permeability, you see that as soon as we increase the blue curve, we increase the red curve because the fault has an initial permeability. And um, if you now go straight to the lower graph, you see also a nonlinear increase in the fault permeability, but you also see that to increase first the permeability, you don't need to lower as much the effective stress, normal stress on the fault, and that the permeability increase is much smaller in the carbonate fault case compared uh, to the Monterey um, shale fault. Just to mention that uh, these two experiments are done at about the same depth, and I would say about the same uh, principal uh, stress um, magnitudes. I would even say that maybe the, the, the Monterey fault is much better oriented to, to sleep uh, compared to the Monterey fault, but let's say roughly um, the, the stress context is comparable um, and um, the protocol, of course, is comparable. Um, this last slide about direct observations is um, to show you a very recent experiment. I'm back to Monterey here, where we, uh, we, we changed the injection fluid. What I showed in the previous slides were um, injections with, I would say, pure water. And recently, we made an experiment where we injected CO2 dissolved in water. So because of the depth uh, of the experiments, I remember to you it's 300 uh, meters. Obviously, we're not injected super critical CO2. We are just injected CO2 dissolved in water. Okay. And um, you see here the very preliminary results. This experiment took place uh, in, in the last April, so it's very recent. But I wanted to show that because there are some interesting observations that we can already make. So again, we made a very simple constant injection flow rate injection. Uh, so that's the upper graph. The uh, graph below is showing the CO2 dissolved. So again, it's a constant CO2 content uh, all along uh, the injection. And now I suggest that you go straight to the lower graph, which is showing uh, the pressure in blue, measure that the point, this time this point is, um, is located about 18 meters from the injection. If you go to the upper right of the slide, the monitoring point is the white star, okay? And the injection point is the blue star. So we are looking at the white star on the, uh, on the lower graph on the left. And um, you have the blue curve, you see it clearly varying a few tens of minutes after the red curve. And the red curve is here, I'm showing just the total displacement of the fault. So obviously we confirm here that we first see a displacement of the fault. And after several minutes, we see the pressure increasing on a very complex way at the same point. Uh, and then, after the pressure increase, what you see, if you go to the, the graph just above the, the dark green graph, it's uh, the CO2 partial pressure at the same point, which is monitored at the same point. And you see that the CO2 that we are injecting at the red point is only arriving, I would say, about one hour after we have started to activate the fault 18 meters away from the injection. Okay. And finally, the, the final interesting result is that you see that with time, um, the displacement tends to decrease. But also, for example, at, from 0.4, you see the pressure starts to decrease. While if you go back to the upper graph, we are still injecting. Okay, We did not stop any injection. Everything is constant about the injection. So what we think is happening there is that uh, 
the CO2 dissolved in water is progressively um, mixing or replacing with the fault formation water. And this is reducing the density of the fault formation water, which is causing a small depressurization of the fault, which is closing um, the fault. And uh, because the fault is closing, or in other words, the effective normal stress on the fault is re-increasing while we're still injecting CO2, the fault displacement is progressively decreasing. So here we have a chronology in the case of a CO2 leakage into a fault, which is quite interesting. First, we always have the fault which is mechanically activated. It kind of dilates a little the fault and favors the penetration of the pore waters uh, into the fault, uh, which only come in two. But we may also question that the first pore waters that we see here between one o'clock and two o'clock actually are the formation water for the which were already in the fault. They are just pushed forward. And uh, after a while, of course, the CO2 arrives at the monitoring point. And finally, when the patch of uh, CO2 leakage is large enough, um, it kind of depressurizes the fault and reduces the fault movement. Uh, so some um, very simple conclusion from these observations. Um, we think from these experiments that there is a decoupling between the slip and the opening um, of a fault which initially has a low permeability. So typically a fault in a cap rock. We think that we first need to have slip or failure in the fault to allow for some dilation. And only after that, the fluid can penetrate the fault. Um, this part is mainly aseismic, but um, some exotic earthquakes, I would call, uh, like tremors, noise, uh, are observed. And at the end, if we inject uh, maybe a volume large enough, it seems that we can create some uh, micro seismicity. And finally, the new result is to say that uh, uh, the CO2, and I, it's a bit early, I, I, I'm not very comfortable with making a big interpretation of the curves I just showed before, but I think either the CO2 is changing the density of the pore fluid into the fault, or there may also be a phase change of the CO2 because the fault dilating, the pressure decreasing, and the CO2 dissolved returning to gas may also change the pressure, but all this is affecting the fault stability. Okay, so second point I would like to show you today is how we try to, to correlate this observation to the fault geology. Um, so some information of all about the fault we, we have been estimating, but I would say as, as all faults, it's not a simple fault. It's a, it's a fixed zone. You find in that all type of, uh, I would say, fault materials, um, which is shown here, you have a principal shear zone, at least one, I would say, with some gouge along that shear zone. Um, and um, uh, th there is some uh, thickness in there. Maybe th there is a second shear zone here. It's, it's not so clear. You have some zones which may be more typical of um, of uh, clay faults. They they call this the specialists call this cali clay. Um, it's a very interesting part in the fault because um, it's the the clay is completely destroyed at all scales, and um, and also you may find some. Uh, ductile um, deformations, as you see here, some microfolds, minerals, clay minerals are deformed, etc. Um, just to mention, the, the fault we are talking about has a length of about uh, five to 10 kilometers and an offset of about five to 10 meters. Um, here is another view of the the main features you can observe on the fault. For example, on the principal shear zone, you see here some nice um, sleek and sides. 
Um, another interesting thing is that close to the, um, the surface of the principal shear zone, if you look at on the right, you may see a, a, a thin skin of reoriented uh, clay minerals um, that explain that reorient along the silicon sides. Here is what the scaly clay looks like. You see, it's it's very low cohesion um, clay uh, cut into smaller and smaller pieces. But you see, it's very interesting because uh, if you look at one piece in details, you see some shiny uh, slick inside um, small scale faults inside that scaly clay, or you see them all around here. So to summarize, I would say in this kind of fault, maybe as in many faults, you have some, uh, I would say, major uh, shear zones, and you have some volumes highly destroyed that we call scaly clay. You may also find some uh, damage, um, damage volume, where it more looks like a, a fracture damage zone. Um, how is this fault formed? Um, it's a complex process. Um, we think um, that it's forming uh, during the, the Jura uh, décollement in, in Switzerland. And um, here again, I make it simple, but uh, um, the, some, um, some um, share uh, is uh, generating in the, in the clay layer. And there is some uh, um, overlapping hooking zones. Uh, and with time, these zones, as you see here, will progressively deform more and more. And we think this uh, is at the origin of what we call the scaly clay. So here is um, a reconstruction of the, I would say, the two uh, surfaces that bound the fault that we are activating. And you see a part of all the balls that we are using in our Monterey experiments. The, for example, the thick red borehole is the injection borehole. And um, you may see also the, the, the dashed, um, the dash purple inclined boreholes uh, or the, well, the, the light purple, I would say, inclined boreholes, which are the ones where we have the, um, uh, the active seismic monitoring. And all the others are different types of monitoring boreholes. But I want, I want to show at this scale is, um, OK, this was reconstructed because all the boreholes in Monterey are fully cored. So we could make correlation be between cores, identify the top and the bottom of the fault, and then we used uh, some um, GoCAD modeling uh, to reconstruct the fault. And at the end, we get this kind of result where you see that obviously uh, the fault is not a plane. Um, it shows some undulations. It shows also some thicknesses, thickness variations. Uh, for example, uh, the thickness of the fault varies between one and, and about six meters. And um, we think that um, these undulations which obviously uh, that we call also asperities. Um, of course, they come from the multiphase history of the fault, but uh, they also correspond to the fixed zones, uh, the fixed zones where uh, you find most of the, the highly deformed uh, scaly clay into the fault. So the first thing we did is just to, uh, to, to, to wrap the top um, of um, that fault surface with um, the P wave anomaly um, velocities images that I described before. Uh, you see here um, three images corresponding. If you remember, we, we made six cy cycles during the, the 2020 experiment. So I, I'm just showing the three first cycles. And um, what you see again, the, the dark uh, P wave anomaly, uh, which is uh, uh, propagating. But what is interesting is that it seems to be propagating, obviously, across one of these asperities that you see here. Uh, so then what we try to understand is why is um, the, the P wave anomaly uh, propagating along the strike of the fault? Because um, it was not straightforward for us. Uh, 
For example, we did some uh, numerical modeling about that. We started with a simple model that you see on the left. Um, it's a fully coupled hydromechanical model done with a, a 3DEC um, commercial software. And the fault is here figured as a simple plane. You see the, the injection balls that are used in the model to, to compare the model results with, uh, uh, with the measurements. And um, we, we first started by applying the stress tensor that is known in many places. The Monterey, um, the Monterey place is, is quite well constrained about the stress. And this is what you're seeing um, on, the, on the right and on the left column on the right. So what you are seeing are um, the, the displacement, uh, sorry, you are seeing the, the pore pressure uh, on the fault. You, you're looking at the fault uh, plane from the front again. So you see the injection ball is the so-called BFSB2. And you see when you apply um, the stress tensor, and of course we apply also the gravity uh, gradient, which is the vertical row here, you see that in that case, the, the pore pressure is, is showing a, a kind of uh, isotropic patch around the injection. And uh, if you remember, for example, if this was true, we would have had the connection between uh, uh, this ball, for example, BCSD7. And if you remember in the measurements, this, was never, this never happened um, in, uh, in the real life. Uh, below, you show the, the slip. And um, no, sorry, you show the normal opening of the fault here in, uh, in the middle and the, and the slip here uh, uh, at, at, the lower, um, at the lower image. And now what we did is we just added in the right column a stress gradient with that orientation, like the, the red curve, and a very small stress gradient, as you see here. And obviously in that case, we propagate uh, the, the pressure, the slip, the opening and the slip, sorry, towards uh, the right of the fault, as is observed in the field. Uh, so what does it mean, this kind of approach? It means that maybe um, the leakage is uh, propagating not because of the stress, it's propagating because of a stress gradient between the injection point and at least uh, the monitoring points at the scale of our experiment, which is about 50 meters that you see here. And where I want to come, if I can move to the next slide, is that um, it could match um, with um, the orientation of these asperities. Here, what you are seeing is, um, is a map uh, front view, I would say, of um, the asperities on the fault surface, you see these, these grayish, I would say, patches. And um, the, um, if you start, for example, on the right, the, the propagation globally, I would say, of uh, the leakage is like the, the red curve. And uh, you see that, obviously, um, it, could, um, it could be interpreted as quite perpendicular to the orientation of the asperities. And why would it be so? Well, because there might be a simple role played by the fault asperities, which is because of the undulation of the fault surface, given a constant stress tensor outside the fault, but the, the normal stress uh, on the fault is uh, displaying some heterogeneity. Uh, and so it, it may be enough in our mind to create enough stress gradient across an asperity for the fluid to propagate. Um, on the right, you see here um, a rough estimation of the slip tendency, so the ratio between the normal and the, and the shear stress on the same surface. And you see also strong contrast in the slip tendency, again, because of the undulations. And we just added on this image those um, um, those white, I would say, white big points, which are the located earthquakes on the fault surface during the injection. Can be discussed, but we, we think, sorry, that uh, up, um, most of these points 
are in the red, red yellowish zones, which correspond to the higher sleep tendency zones. And again, we could imagine that uh, the asperities create a stress gradient and also some shear stress concentrations because of their shape that also explain the induced seismicity while we are um, injecting in the fault. But the other interesting thing is that uh, it's not only a question of the geometry of the asperities. Here we are showing another interesting observation in a borehole which is drilled through one of these asperities. And um, so you, uh, you, as I said before, uh, we have some fibers that continuously monitor um, the distribution of the strains along the ball. So here I'm showing some um, DSS, I would say fibers uh, strains, which is the, the red curve. Um, and um, you have the, the strain changes in the micro strains. Here is the X axis. And the vertical axis is the, the depth along the ball. And on the, um, on the right of that, I'm just showing it may be a bit complex, but the limits of the, the upper part of, of the fault, the top, you see that uh, thick um, pink dashed line and of the lower part. So just showing first that the strain only distribute and vary inside the fault zone, as you see here. And I think the other interesting point is that you see some positive uh, peaks in strains. You see that I tried to figure these blue arrows, but also some negative ones. So it means that inside that asperity, you have some zones where you have an extension along the ball axis and some zones where you have a contraction at the same time, because that curve is a, is a snapshot I would say, of the strain distribution at one given time during the experiment. First, we can see that um, these peaks may correlate with some major features inside, inside the, the fault. You see figures as, as red. Um, and um, we can also see, if you look, there is this kind of inclined um, optical log that was done after the injection. Uh, quite close to, to that monitoring well. And you see three, um, three wet zones in the ball. And these three wet zones may roughly correspond to the, the free zones where uh, we have the extensions in the ball. So in other words, what we think is happening here is that, um, of course, in these thick asperities, there is not one freed flow path, there are several, they open the fault, but outside um, these flow paths, there is a contraction or a compression of, uh, of the zones. And even if I wanted to go into more details, we think that the largest contraction zones may correspond to zones which are the most damaged in the fault zones, such as these scaly clay, um, scaly clay zones. So might be a bit tricky here, but I would say that we, we can, with this kind of experiment, get quite deep into the, the links between fault zone activation and its geology. And I would say, if we consider all faults have asperities, um, there is maybe a role of the asperity geometry in uh, displaying some kind of stress heterogeneity that can guide the propagation of leakage, but there is also some leakage inside the asperity in some preferential paths. And this is associated to much more complex hydromechanical couplings inside the fault, including some sleep and dilation, but also some places where uh, you have compaction. Uh, last, maybe I did not explain this very well. I will go. Uh, fast on that, but um, 
we, we also questioned ourselves about the representativity of the opalinus clay um, for um, other uh, shales. It's considered overcompacted for um, for people, but you you may have seen. I, I went fast on it, but I showed that, uh, for example, the scaly clay is showing some um, ductile deformation. So that that fault went through some ductile deformation, and um, and uh, you see that uh, this ductile deformation reactivated into dilatant chair. So in details, it might be uh, very complex. Okay, I will finish with a bunch. I would say two or three slides to show you um, what these experiments may bring in terms of uh, validating some uh, monitoring techniques. Uh, this is again uh, the um, P wave velocity anomaly. And um, there is a nice work done by collaborators. They used a very simple uh, poroelastic model which is coupling, um, let's say, um, which is first figuring the fault as a, a, a thick layer of, of spheres, which are in contact with each other in order that you can apply uh, poor elastic theory. Uh, and then they use this equivalent media to estimate uh, the P wave velocities. And what they do, they just manually change the thickness of the layer until they explain or they match with the measured change in the P-wave velocity, which in other words, allows them to estimate the fault uh, normal displacement from the variations in the P-wave velocities. And this is the graph that you're seeing here. And um, the, the red one is the one at the white star here at the monitoring well. It's always the same well. And the blue one is at the injection. So first result, which is very interesting, is that you see that there is more opening of the fault about 18 meters away from the injection where there is the maximum injection pressure. But what I want to show here is um, that we can calibrate um, that uh, estimated normal opening. And if you just look at what is measured at the injection, the blue curve, you see, for example, that we have about 500 to 600 um, micrometers of, um, of displacement, okay? The blue curve at the peaks here. And because um, we have these balls with the optical fibers, we can first um, look, uh, uh, see where the deformation is localized. And this is what is shown here. This is a DSS uh, strain. Here it's, it's shown at different depths along the injection borehole. You see, and with time, and you see that, um, let's say there are three, four curves where there is a large signal. And these three curves span over roughly one meter length of the ball. And if you read here, for example, you take the maximum, you have, um, five to 600 micro strains over one meter. So it makes 500 to 600 um, micrometers. And so it matches quite well with what is estimated uh, from the P waves uh, velocities variations. So this model might be very simple, but it shows that maybe we can use this active seismic monitoring method to estimate, at least I would say, the fault uh, normal displacement. The other slide I want to show, and I think that will be one of my last slides, is um, the link between the, the leakage and the seismicity. Uh, in that experiment, we could localize some earthquakes. And um, this is what I am showing uh, on the left here. I'm sorry for the poor quality of that uh, image, but it's again the same P wave velocity image with the uh, dark blue P wave anomaly you see here. Uh, this is at cycle um, um, three during the injection. And um, the, the, the red uh, points are the, um, the earthquakes that we could localize. We could not localize all the earthquakes, but uh, at least some of them. And I think it's quite clear that uh, most of them are outside uh, the blue patch. So if we consider, as I said before, that the blue patch 
is where the leakage is occurring. It means that the, the earthquakes are outside um, the leakage um, patch. But um, where are they then? And then we made this modeling and we also had measurements. And uh, we found out uh, that actually in, in, when you activate such a fault, you have two patches. You have the patch uh, where you have the high pressure. Sorry, I lost my mouse. If you look at the right here, that's a model. And you have a much larger one, which depends on many parameters in the fault. You, you can vary that the, the size of this patch depending on the, the friction on the fault or on, um, on some other parameters. But anyway, this patch is always larger. And that's where we call the, the rupture patch because all this patch in the model is, um, is, uh, is broken. We use a, a Coulomb failure criteria here. And so we may think that um, that's what, why we, we see this here, where we, you have the pressurized patch. Actually, you have a, a very large opening of the fault compared to the slip. And certainly, it's mostly aseismic. While outside this patch, um, you have a, a rupture, which is favored by the, the stress concentration, the shear stress concentration of the fault at the limit of the pressurized patch, but which extends much larger away from the pressure patch. And it's in that patch that you have most of the induced earthquakes. So some conclusions here. As I said, possible to use active seismic methods to estimate fault displacements. And induced seismicity, I would say, um, um, well, it's maybe not new that um, uh, seismicity is not exactly located where leakage is occurring. And um, so we must take this information with caution. But it's also interesting to see that um, if we consider that at least in the case of this low permeability fault, you have first, first to rupture the fault, to dilate them, and then allow for the fluid to penetrate, then the micro seismicity can be a proxy or precursor of a potential leakage development in that given fault. Um, my last uh, conclusion slide, I would say, um, as you see, we, we have several of these um, in situ experiments here. I, I focused on shales. Um, they allow to, um, to, to test new technologies applied to fault monitoring, especially these kind of technologies that do not rely so much on uh, seismicity and um, which might help better characterize all the aseismic component of fault activation, which is great and important in this kind of rock. Um, some uh, fundamental research is that um, in this low permeability fault, what I show is this kind of decoupling between slip opening and, and fluid pressure migration. Uh, well, more work to show, hopefully in <laughs> In two or three years, we would be able to, to talk about long-term ceiling because after this activation, for example, the last one, we have set everything in a very long-term monitoring. We want to see if that fault is going to uh, to seal um, and, um, and uh, to see also for how long after an activation, we can still detect something with the given techniques that we have deployed to monitor uh, the fault activation. Um, if I change scale, um, I think, but it's it's still a bit tricky to conclude on that because we have done some experiments, but I would say we never do enough experiments maybe, but it seems to me that um, we highlight here a, a contrast uh, in the hydromechanical response between a, a reservoir fault and a caprock fault. And if I had, uh, just a takeaway message would be in the Caprock for the fault to leak, you need uh, to, to have a, um, a failure in shear first. So you need first slip, then leakage. In the reservoir, it's all the opposite, I would say, because the fault obviously may have, at least in the damage zone of the fault, may have some an initial permeability. The pressure will be certainly the trigger. Um, and um, and this has some consequences. For example, in the first case, uh, but the leakage will only maybe occur where or in some places where you have failure. 
so it will be more discrete, the leakage, while in the reservoir, maybe because of the better connections uh, within the damage zone of the fault, you will have a more distributed leakage. Um, and the other point I would say is, um, uh, would be quite interesting, I would say, to, 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 um, to upscale these monitoring methods and to, to see if we are able to detect, uh, uh, to detect uh, fault uh, displacements, um, for example, from um, active seismic monitoring. I would recommend always combined with uh, strain monitoring in different ways. Thank you very much. Just my last slide, I promised it at the beginning, I'm really not the only one on this um, on this part. I'm just kind of the PI doing some part of it. And you see all the people, it's really an international collaboration with many people involved um, in this kind of project. Thank you very much. Great, well, thank you for the very interesting talk, Eve. You covered a lot of observations and uh, really unique insights into uh, how these fault systems are responding. So, so thank you very much. We're, we're late starting and we're running a bit long. So maybe we can have, uh, there's a number of questions in the, the chat window. Maybe we can go through it afterwards and have more of an informal discussion, but uh, what, let's go ahead and kind of wrap it up in case anybody has to jump off. So um, on behalf of ARMA, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining today. Just a reminder that the next webinar is gonna be August 4th, Mark, uh, Novakovic from Nanometrics is going to be talking about ground motion, so another uh, interesting topic, and uh, watch for the invitations from uh, from Maddie. Um, great. Eve, do you have uh, a few minutes to uh, stick around, and uh, we can maybe have some informal discussion with some of the questions in the chat window, if that's okay? Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so I can... I can help you. Maybe we can just start at the top and go down uh, the list. Um, so the first one, Dave Eaton was wondering about uh, if there's any risk assessments. Dave, enough. Are you? Uh, if you're there, if you want to unmute and uh, follow up on your question, you may have jumped off, Eve. But uh, was there? Were the? Again, again, I'm sorry. Uh, obviously. Uh... Okay. You know, the, the, the very funny thing is, you may know that Monterey uh, initially is a lab dedicated to um, nuclear repository research. Uh, with, uh, I would say, at least uh, more than 40 continuously running experiments over years. And then there was a guy coming and saying, I'm going to activate a fault and break everything. Uh, <laughs> so we had kind of... Uh, a risk assessment based on, um, I would say, the, the current knowledge at the time of how to um, estimate um, what would be the magnitude of the earthquakes uh, given um, the magnitude of the movement we were expecting to to generate on um, on the fault. Uh, so that's how we did it. Um, the other point that recently arised is that. Um, it, the risk assessment was not so much, people were not so much concerned by the seismicity because I, actually initially they did not even trust we would create any earthquake actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, they were more concerned by the leakage and um, the leakage that could um, connect to another experiment or uh, the leakage of CO2 everywhere in the galleries and, you know. And so uh, this was more tricky, for example, to uh, to, to, to demonstrate, we were not able to demonstrate it actually, <laughs> uh, that there would no, there would be no, for example, CO2 leakage in the galleries. And so the way we, we took the, the problem was to say, okay, we, we don't know, but we are going to over instrument the galleries with um, uh, CO2 sensors and this kind of detection system, completely independent from um, the, the science uh, dedicated sensors. And um, and then there were there were a series of plans. If, for example, the leakage rate was uh, turning to be too high, um, we, we could at, at, at the end have to, to completely stop the experiment. Um, so that's, I guess, part of the, the answer to this question. <laughs> okay. The, 
there's another question kind of on a related topic from uh, Jingo Li. Um, I don't think you mentioned the magnitudes of the, the induced events you were describing. And I think you referred to them as earthquakes and micro seismic, presumably small magnitude. We think the, the maximum magnitude is still work in progress, so it should be around minus two. Uh, that should be the maximum magnitude of these earthquakes. Uh, even the fact that we did not inject, we're not injecting so large uh, volumes of water, of water with CO2, you know, so. Uh, um, so yeah, um, it's still work in progress. I think it's uh, minus two or below. I would say minus two to minus four. Um, okay. Um, and then I guess moving on just through the chat window, uh, Colin Sayers has a question about the active uh, seismic system in the topography. Colin, are you there? Do you wanna unmute and? Yeah, Colin Sayers here. Uh, Good morning, Eve. Thanks for a great talk. Um, you didn't really spend much time talking about the active seismic monitoring system, so it wasn't clear to me whether this was transmission using tomography or whether it was uh, reflection using reflection amplitudes to get the uh, the changes in velocity. And also, um, what assumptions did you make to localize the change in velocity on the fault? What would be the resolution in the fault normal direction? Um, so um, it's it's transmission. Um, we we are looking at the, um, the change in the travel time uh, between uh, the, uh, one source located in, on one side of the fault and the receiver on the other side. Um, and um, as you you have seen, I guess is uh, that uh, we 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 did set actually initially we didn't know if we would be able to see something, but. Um, after some uh, thinking, we decided to to set the, uh, the the sources and the receivers, let's say about five meters away from the fault zone. So it means that if you consider a fault zone uh, thickness of two to ten meters, in average, uh, the distance between uh, one source and one receiver would be uh, thirty to forty meters. Okay, um, depending on the the, the the orientation of the ray path. And did, um, did you see uh, changes in amplitude that you could use? Yeah, changes in amplitude. And, um, and now I'm trying to think, because as you may imagine, I'm not the specialist of that. It's uh, something that was developed by um, uh, Tom Daley. And, uh, and the people working that uh, are the, the Rice Group. Um, it's uh, Jonathan Ajo Franklin, Franklin um, uh, with Professor at Rice now, um, but uh, it's uh, it's highly repeatable. It's, it seems to me that it's uh, it's uh, it's much smaller than the. Uh, I I would say you see thing I I I prefer to 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 look back into some slides and, and I can send you that in into um into the chat after after this meeting if if you don't mind because okay that would be great I, I would not uh, like to say a, a silly thing about the, the the orders of magnitudes that's really not my part. Yeah. But, also, uh, also, if you have the uh, if you have a link to the the modeling study where you represented the fault as a, a bunch of spheres, that would be interesting too. If yeah, you... so this this is a, a paper currently uh, submitted to um, a geophysical research letter. I don't know. I don't think it is uh, yet published. But um, as soon as we have this information, I can communicate it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right, so moving on, there's a couple uh, questions about the CO2 that are the CO2 portion of your talk. You've seemed to generate some interest, maybe not surprisingly. So the first one is Jean-Philippe Avouac. Uh, Jean-Philippe, are you there? Do you want to? Uh... Yes, thank you, Sean. So I enjoy your talk. I was very happy to see the, the new results from Monterrey. They are really nice. I have one question regarding the experiment where you uh, inject uh, water with dissolved CO2. It looks like the shear displacement uh, in, uh, it goes in one direction first and then goes backward, and that the backward displacement is larger than the initial uh, displacement. So which direction is consistent with the initial state of stress? And uh, do you have an explanation for, for the, the backward motion being larger than the first one? Well, actually, for the backward motion as a first place. Mm -hmm. 
actually, actually the, um, um, my explanation for the, the backward motion now is uh, is better. I, I'm more comfortable in answering this question than I think we we had that same question when we were working on the carbonates, I guess. But um, thanks to these uh, distributed uh, fibers, we clearly see that um, some other um, um, some other splay faults or secondary faults are are activating. You know, activated. Sorry, um, uh, during the injection, and um, since they are not activated exactly at the same time. Um, the, the what we observe is that, um, for example, I showed some of these uh, contraction effects. You see, mm -hmm. um, they 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 turn to be predominant at some periods. Maybe uh, I don't know the reason. You know, compared to others, one fold activating uh, somewhere in the fold zone, and 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 these events of contraction relate with uh, some uh, back uh, back share. I would say uh, on um, on the main. Um, on the, on the principal share zone. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the, the amount of uh, back share compared to the, the share um, is kind of related to a very complex uh, bulk behavior of the fault. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, w when you have, uh, when you are getting into that, so this is happening with time, obviously, um, you are getting away and away from um, the uh, from a, a displacement orientation that would be consistent, I would say, with the initial stress tensor. You you are really in this in a stimulated volume where I think it's it's no more um, so dependent on the, the initial tensor. So the the initial um, share that that happens, um, I would say, just before. Which is very clear, you know, that is happening just before you see, for example, at the same point the arrival of the pressure. Mm -hmm. This one is very consistent with the stress tensor, but afterwards it's really, really getting complex. Okay, thank you. Actually, that kind of following on a similar uh, um, point, just a question from me. So, when you looked at the the DAS strain response on the fiber compared to your direct strain observations on the, the strain meters in the cell. Was it a one-to-one? -one? Obviously, the fiber is kind of a uniaxial strain response along the, the axis, but uh, seems to be a lot of debate in the fiber optic world if, uh, if there be a true one-to-one uh, -one between observed DSS strain and observed strain. Oh. Um... There, I, I could have added uh, about uh, 50 slides on that because, um, <laughs> <I'm sure>. um, <laughs> you know, first um, uh, we, we, it was very tricky because we have, uh, for example, we have DSS fibers, so based on the Brie um, approach. Uh, and you know, uh, one key problem is that the gauge length, what they call the gauge length on the fibers is very different. For example, the DSS gauge length is one meter. The DAS fibers we used where the gauge length was 10 meters. So obviously the, the, the strain measured by the DAS was integrating a, a larger length of the ball, you know, not even mentioning that the orientation. And in between, uh, we recently uh, managed to, to use um, um, a relay frequency shift approach. Uh, and this one is very interesting because the gauge length is falling to uh, something like 50, 10 to 15 centimeters. Uh, and that's what I showed actually here because really there we can we can make a nice correlation with uh, the geological features, for example, um, that uh, you have on the ball log. Um, so now to answer your question, it, it I would say the, the DAS, for example, um, what we so far we have looked mostly at, at the DAS uh, in the low frequency uh, mode, okay? We have not looked at the high frequency content of the dust, although there, is, there are some interesting signals there, for, for example, many tremors and these kind of things. But we, we mostly look at the low frequency content. And, um, and uh, because of the high frequency rate of uh, the dust, uh, obviously the resolution uh, of the uh, displacement magnitude variations, for example, the, sorry, the strain magnitude variation is much better than the DSS. But Again, because of the larger gauge length, 
um, it's very hard. Uh, they, there is no reason that both match between the, the DSS and the DAS uh, system, you know, except in some cases where you have an ultra localized um, fault um, activation, which in some places, in some boreholes, is occurring. So I think that would be a, a nice uh, way to dig. If the DAS and the DSS match well, it means that maybe you have a localization in the fault. But if they don't match, you have a more distributed behavior of the fault. For example, between the asperities uh, where you have a, a larger or thicker fault compared to zones outside the asperities where the fault is uh, one meter thick. So um, in other words, in a 10 meter thick uh, fault zone, uh, there is really no chance to match uh, the signal between the DSS and the DAS because uh, of what I showed, uh, opening and of uh, contraction and uh, extension of the fibers. But uh, in the one meter thick uh, zones, it's much better matching. Interesting. Well, sorry to open a can of worms there. I think a few of the questions might be uh, a Pandora's box of... <laughs> um, it, Sorry, I jumped in there, but Jens, do you want, you had a couple of questions. Do you want to? Yeah, I was actually going to uh, first point to uh, a question after mine by Elena Konstantinovskaya, uh, uh, who was asking something related to uh, your, your answer to uh, Jean-Philippe Abouac's question. And it was, um, uh, Elena, please feel free to unmute. But um, the, the question was about whether you see any changes in SH max orientations. I assume that's in the pre-slip uh, um, uh stress field or or if you saw any change in sh max orientation like a, some rotation um as a result of fa fault reactivation again again on that ahead, uh, just to um to, to add uh, i would say uh, um in the very initial activation period uh, we we have kind of a very consistent um i would say uh, for example sleep response of the fault at points which are away from the injection. When the, the stimulation volume in the fault is growing, then it's it starts to, to become a mess, I would say. <laughs> uh, and, and I think their uh, displacement do not really follow the, the stress tensor. You know, it's, it's, it's more, uh, you see, it's more an interplay within the fault, uh, the bulk of the fault, an interplay between zones which are contracting and zones which are dilating. And this this is guiding the the share along uh, uh, the the few major, for example, uh, discontinuities that uh, that are also in the fault. So so then it, it's getting very complex. I would say <laughs> it's better to shift to uh, to a bulk analysis of the fault at this time. It's too complex for me at this. <laughs> yeah, my the additional question: uh, if the asperity size is large enough to to expect to that. You know, when the asperities happen on the fold, we, we have some different orientation of that asperity relative to the stress tensor. So if the size of the asperities is large enough to induce any changes in the reactivation on that asperities, or it's too small? I, I, I think uh, it's what is inside the asperity. So it's uh, obviously related to the thickness of the asperity, but more than the thickness, it's related to the material which is inside the asperity. And for example, in the type of fault we are working on, that's scaly clay, um, which is thicker in the asperities, but uh, thicker, um, there, are, there are variations in thickness. If you, you have a big amount of scaly clay, uh, you will favor um, little dilation and a lot of compaction in that asperity, you see? Uh, although you are injecting, although uh, your fault permeability uh, globally is increasing, you see? So um, you may have, I think, some compaction while you are dilating uh, globally the fault uh, in some asperities, depending on the on the um, mechanical properties of the fault material inside the asperity. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, I guess ask mine now. That's by the way that that is very interesting because I think that's getting kind of to the you know you're pushing the boundaries of what we understand about how faults. Uh, Flip and how stress uh, works on them in a detailed way that is far beyond what we're capable, I guess, of um, you know, of, of um, modeling to first order. If that's a fair assessment. Um, my question was uh, about uh, um, carbon um, CO two injection uh, in various various phases and whether 
you can sort of generalize the differences between um, uh, fault failure due to CO2 injection versus to brine injection. Um, and I kind of broke that into two categories that, you know, the pressure front will be different uh, potentially, you know, could be different with uh, CO2 as the fluid um, uh, being injected. And the other one, which I was more directly focusing on was whether the failure criterion um, is different in any way. Uh, in other words, you know, is, are there frictional differences on the fault plane itself when you're dealing with uh, CO2 in there, but uh, especially does the normal stress change uh, in a different way um, when it's when it's some, one of the phases of uh, CO2 fluids, you know, is does the is, is Skempton's coefficient or the Biot coefficient or something different resulting in a different effective normal stress that would, you know, cause failure in a different way if that if hopefully that makes sense. So yeah, it's just about sort of like putting all this together. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I would say uh, first, um, I would I would ask you to be uh, very um, uh, how do you say uh, uh, to to pardon me for what I'm going to say because uh, we we are still trying to understand what we did in April so it's quite uh, uh, quite a recent um, um, result but I wanted to show it today because it's um, one thing that um, we observed uh, which is clear uh, because um, before doing that long injection uh, we made some small um, very small um, activation test, you know, uh, small duration, small volume. To compare uh, when we um, activate uh, the fault with um, brine or pure, pure water, I would say, and with uh, CO2 dissolved in water. Clearly, um, you you need uh, to apply more uh, total pressure, I would say, uh, to the CO2 dissolved in water to activate the fault. Because I think the the density uh, of the CO two dissolved in water uh, fluid is uh, is uh, smaller, you know. So uh, if if you if you just take this as a result, you would say that um, it's harder to activate a fault uh, with CO two dissolved in water. Talking only about pressure. Uh, now um, about uh, the effect of CO two and fault friction. Honestly, I, I don't know, and I'm not sure we will be able to go, in, uh, unfortunately, in that detail uh, with uh, such relatively large scale experiment. But there is one thing where maybe we can contribute is, um, I, I just mentioned it because it's not very clear, but uh, you know, um, when the fault, uh, just to give you an idea, um, you may have seen it on the graphs, but um, the activation of the fault in, in our experiment corresponds to about, uh, you, you may have seen it, it's about 500 micrometers of opening. Uh, and, um, and so it's quite a dilation actually. And um, it, it clearly corresponds to a drastic change in the pressure and um, a little everywhere in the fault. And um, given the fact that in our case, uh, we are, uh, you know, we are, we are close. We, we, are in, uh, we are only using, I would say, CO2 saturated with such uh, CO2 dissolved in, in water. Uh, so uh, a small drop in pressure um, kind of instantaneously uh, makes that uh, we have a desaturation of our CO2. And at the end in the fault, we have at least uh, two phases. We have a phase of CO2 dissolved in water and we have a gas phase in the fault, which hmm. is expanding. And, uh, and at least this, we, we saw it very well on the P-wave velocities. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it was a bit early to show you that. Uh, but I think this is really playing a role because it, 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 at the end, you, you have a fault with uh, three types of uh, fluid patches, I would say. You have uh, the formation patch, water not contaminated by the leakage. You have the patch of uh, CO2 dissolved in water. And you have a gas bubble, big one, you know, uh, and uh, and at this time we I, uh, it's a bit early to say, but I think we we start seeing some, at least we see some noise on all the displacements and everything. I cannot say much more right now today, but there is a change occurring in the fault. Uh, so uh, does it create more instability overall on the stimulated patch uh, of the fault? Maybe. Hmm. See. Thank you. That that uh, went in kind of unexpected directions for me. So that's, and in fact, uh, Kondal already asked a, a question about 
gas, uh, um, CO2 in gas form versus dissolving water as you were talking. So uh, he must have read your mind or vice versa. Thank you. Uh, just to kind of build on Jens's initial question, I guess the, uh, <clears throat> he talked about the, the three deck modeling, I think that uh, was performed. But if you look at kind of basic first principles, maybe with a brine system instead of the added complications of the, uh, the dissolved CO2, just in terms of initiation of the, the fracture, does, it, does a more coolant kind of frictional sliding model work for the pressure that you're putting into the system? You know, there's a lot of work. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, fault slip potential software that uh, Stanford put together, for instance, which is used pretty extensively in the induced seismicity world. And I wonder, does it work in this particular case? Yeah, I think it works. Um, we we tested different um, uh, criteria, I would say. Uh, the, the, the best one to explain the leakage, actually, is to produce um, a coolant failure first. Uh, and um, uh, of course, in a in a, um, in a dilatant um, context, okay. So the coolant failure is, is important because uh, there is some dilation associated to it, actually, uh, and then the leakage can propagate into the model. You know that's um, and that's really the, the best way we found to explain uh, this this uh, localized patch. You know, so in other words, uh, in this uh, tridec model, where there is no failure on a fault element in the model. There is no flow. That's how we we uh, we run the model, you know. And uh, there is only flow where there is a coulomb failure. And this works. I would say it it, it kind of shows uh, the temporal a decent temporal variation. For example, this this drastic increase in the flow rate as soon as the as the um, as the the, the fault is activated, you know. And before you have nothing. Uh, that's the way we we found uh, to, to explain it, you know, and um, we we had the questions in, in many from many reviewers for first of all saying oh but it looks like hydro fracture you know uh, so it it could be more um, mixed mode or a, a more even a tensile failure yes but if if we apply that it doesn't work you know because uh, you have no propagation um, unless you 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 force uh, uh, much more than what we do in in real life you know and um, and the other point is that. Um, uh, at, at all points, we we measure that that sharing before um, before any uh, displacement normal to the fault. So um, the more coolant failure works well. Uh, the permeability associated to that more coolant failure seems to work to explain the leakage in this type of uh, initially very low permeable faults. You know, now the fact that we we need to go to very low normal stress. I think it's uh, maybe just because our fault is Monterey is not so well oriented versus, uh, for, for failure versus uh, versus stress, you know. So um, uh, that's uh, that's more classical, I would say. Uh, yeah. Great. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, I guess returning to the chat and uh, appreciate you sticking around. You hope yeah, you no have a few more minutes. We, I think we're towards the end of the list here. I, I was uh, maybe a bit long, so I can stay longer or two. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, Shingo Lee asked another question. Shingo, are, are you still there? So the question is uh, um, whether or not the <clears throat> spatial temporal distribution of the micro seismic events, if that uh, correlated with the uh, the modeled slip or the conceptual slip tendency and the, the preferential flow direction? Yes and no, I would say. Uh, if, if you look, uh, I showed a very rough image uh, of that. Uh, yes, the seismicity seems to be developing in the same direction as the leakage, but not where the leakage is occurring. That's uh, what I would say. It's uh, to give you uh, uh, an order of a range of a scale, I would say, uh, uh, we, we, we see earthquakes on the fault, given the accuracy of the, um, of the localization, about, uh, I would say, between one meter to 10 meters away from uh, where uh, we have that uh, P wave anomaly uh, uh, seen on, on the active seismic monitoring. 
But uh, I would say roughly, yes, uh, with time and space, the seismicity seems to develop kind of in the direction uh, of that anomaly. So yes, that's, that's quite an interesting uh, uh, positive result for seismicity, I would say. Yeah. Great. And then Elizabeth Cochran has a, has a question. Elizabeth, do you want to? Sure. Uh, so I don't, I might have missed this when you were giving your talk, and thanks for a great talk. Um, when you were talking about the leakage front, was that the location of the CO2 plume, or was that, did you interpret that to be the pressure front? Um, that was the pressure front because uh, so far we have not done a model with um, a multiphase um, injection uh, fluid. We, we just use water. Uh, okay. But um, to, to give you some insights, uh, if you remember uh, the slide where I'm showing um, the, the, the first results of the CO2 injection experiment, um, we clearly see that um, there is first um, uh, the pressure increase about at, at a monitoring point, for example, this is increasing about one hour before we, we see the arrival of the CO2 right. at the same point, you see? Mm -hmm. uh, so we think that um, it's the pressure front, but the pressure front is made of maybe the, the fault initial formation water. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, so I would assume your CO2 plume would displace the original pressure or original formation fluids, and so you get a yeah. sort of yeah, that's what we regular see. brine pressure front followed by the CO two plume. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. So there's a couple more comments of appreciation for the talk, and uh, um, I think everybody's unanimously declared it a, a very interesting talk. So thank you. Uh, in terms of questions, Condo Ready has a talk about uh, the seismicity trigger in the, the Cap Rock versus the reservoir. Condo, are you still there? Do you want to unmute? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just I was uh, asking about uh, uh, the hydrothermal response, the fault hydrothermal hydromechanical response. Uh, uh, they uh, explained about the Cap Rock against the Cap Rock and the reservoir against the reservoir. But what if uh, we have a cap rock against a reservoir rock? What kind of a trigger expected? And additionally, if the cap rock properties changes, uh, depending on what depth we are in, so they can be soft or they can be indurated hard rocks. So what kind of a trigger mechanisms expected in these scenarios? Huh. Um... My, um, this is pure um, imagination from me. Sorry for that, but my idea would be that um, obviously the pressure should increase first in the reservoir and maybe trigger um, trigger the activation of um, a fault in the reservoir. Um, could be seismic or aseismic, but anyway, uh, you could trigger some creep or some slow slip in the on the fault in the reservoir. And imagine now that this fault is also penetrating the cap rock. That would be the trigger for failure in the Caprock uh, fault, uh, part of the fault, you see. Um, that would uh, then uh, open uh, slightly the fault and allow for the leakage, and then uh, the, the mechanism will go on, you know. So um, that, that's how I would see the interaction between um, the, the activation in the reservoir, in the, in the zone of the, in the zone of the fault in the reservoir, and uh, the interaction with the, the, the zone of the same fault, for example, in the Caprock. Uh, yeah, so um, that it's, it's kind of known um, that, for example, um, this could be also favored by, uh, but uh, we, we don't see that in these experiments because they're more, in, in a way, simple than that. But um, it, it may also depend on uh, uh, how uh, much, for example, the, the, the reservoir fault is uh, um, is uh, inducing some compartmentalization of um, of the flow inside the reservoir. You know, uh, I think here in these experiments we are much dealing with uh, permeability parallel to the fault, but there is another permeability uh, across the fault, which may be crucial in the reservoir. And let's imagine that if there is a low permeability across the fault in the reservoir that favors more permeability along the fault, that favors more failure in the reservoir, which could trigger 
uh, some slow sleep that could propagate to the caprock and blah, blah, blah. You see, that's um, clearly the, the caprock reservoir fault um, is, is a point of uh, weakness. And there are many uh, scenarios we could explore to see how they interact with each other. Thank you. So just uh, two more questions, Eve. Uh, the first one should be pretty straightforward because I think you mentioned it. Uh, Sofan Jazer is asking uh, what software you use for the simulations, I think you mentioned. Um, we use a uh, 3DEC, of course, uh, as I mentioned. We also use a uh, TEFLAC uh, 3D at, at Berkeley. Uh, for uh, for example, now we are we are starting some multi-phase um, fault activation um, numerical um, models. And then the last question, uh, Gonzalo Navarre, who I think is there. Do you want to ask your question, Gonzalo? Yeah, no, fair enough. Thank, thanks. Uh, um, just to, uh, I think you 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 you, you said it through the course of your presentation, um, Eve, it's about the the contents of the leaking test that you did, or was or was, com co was completed. Um, I cautious maybe to constrain the narrative to this test is not really a leak test from the reservoir because the CO2 is already solved. Yeah. It's not an immiscible pressure. So we're looking at very low saturation CO2. So in fact, the CO2 already has leaked the reservoir and you're yeah. modeling a very shallow leaking test at some very low pressures because CO2 is already an immiscible yeah. state. So I invite you to maybe hopefully we, um, because the narrative has to be, otherwise we've been interpreted that we're, your tests are leakage tests from the reservoir, uh, which, you know, they are not. And, um, but very, 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 very important outcomes, I see it. But it's just, what, what equivalent depth do you think you are modeling in this field test that you did for leakage? Uh, you know, first, keep it... first uh, yeah, I understand. You uh, completely agree with you. Um, just the protocol of our experiments, we inject directly into the fault, which obviously is, is far from uh, <laughs> uh, real life, I would say. Uh, hopefully, uh, at least. Uh, uh, and we inject directly uh, into a fault, which is already inside um, of a nested into um, a caprock, you know. So um, that's the first point. It's, it's, it's really not... Um, the, the the scenario we expect and the second point as you mentioned we we are at uh, about 300 meters depth so it's very shallow uh, to 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 dissolve our co2 um, we we prepare the dissolution at uh, 2.5 megapascals and then we we inject at about uh, 4 to 5 megapascals so roughly uh, we we are not so deep we are between uh, 3 and 500 meters i would say maximum yeah. Uh, for for these experiments, uh, and unfortunately, we, we cannot do much more than that, given um, the, yeah, no the, the context of the site. You know, yeah. Uh, and, and just to because if if, if a, a real CT injection will not happen those depths, you know, it will have to have a, a kilometer deep, seven yeah. MPA, uh, commercial size uh, injecting at thirty five MPA. So um, you know, I think we're looking at a, a test with that CT already breach the containment. And the Cabroca war testing is an, a secondary seal that yeah. is uh, is just to see what happened with this um, shallow um, horizons that CO2 maybe have seen in the surface. And but um, uh, anyway, just to just to echo that the, the it is not really a CO2 storage leak that you're modeling uh, from the containment. It's just already breached through and you're already a 400, 300, 300 meters deep. Yeah, yeah, we are we are already clearly shallower than. Uh... Yeah, thank the you. reservoir cap rock level for sure. Yeah, no, very interesting talk. Very, very good. Thank you. Well, that's the end of the questions. Thanks, uh, thanks for your uh, patience and accommodation. You have to to go through uh, all that. It obviously generated a lot of interest, which is great, and touched on a lot of fundamental uh, rock mechanics concepts, which is equally obviously the the context of the, these webinars. So, so thank you. Thank you again. Thank you a lot for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you so much, Eve. Great presentation. I enjoyed it a Thank lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, <clears throat> thanks again. And uh, um, thanks for the talk, Eve and Marty. I guess we'll see you in a month's time.
Exactly. Yeah. I look forward to that. Okay. Bye, everyone. Then. Great. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.